welcome to Christ Alone Evangelical Lutheran Church of Thienesville in Mequon, Wisconsin, as we gather for worship on this, the 21st Sunday in the season of Pentecost. Here again to worship our Lord and to appreciate his great love and forgiveness to all of us. May the Lord bless you as we worship together. Our worship service opens with the singing of the first hymn, Praise the Almighty, My Soul Adore Him. We gather for worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice. For the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do, you should cast me away from your presence forever. O Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In mercy, let us pray to the Lord. For the well-being of all people everywhere, that they may receive from you all they need to sustain body and life. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the spread of your life-giving gospel throughout the world, that all who are lost in sin may be brought to faith in you. Hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ, have mercy. For patience and perseverance in this life, 
that we may not lose the hope of heaven as we await your return. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord of life, live in us that we may live for you. Amen. We join with our choir as they sing verse 4 of Praise the Almighty, My Soul Adore Him. We join now in the prayer of the day. O Lord, our God, so govern the nations on earth and direct the affairs of this world that your church may worship you in peace and joy. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading this day is recorded for us in the Old Testament book of Daniel, chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I am afraid of my lord the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard, whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with him, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. 
And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. This is the word of the Lord. We now invite you to join with our choir as they lead us in singing Psalm 96. Our second reading is recorded for us in the book of Romans, chapter 13. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from the fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath, to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants, who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor then honor. This too, the word of our God. We join now in our gospel acclamation, Alleluia! In Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. Alleluia! Our gospel reading is recorded for us in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22. 
Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him, that would be Jesus, in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, Whose image is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. The Gospel of the Lord. Our worship continues as we join in our hymn of the day, Oh, that the Lord would guide my way. Grace and peace to you, brothers and sisters, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today's text comes from the book of Daniel, chapter 1, beginning at verse 3 to 21. In 605 BC, after defeating the Egyptians, Nebuchadnezzar II toured Israel. During his trip, he besieged Jerusalem and took royal captives, including Daniel, who was brought to Babylon for training in the king's court. As an exile, Daniel faced significant challenges. He grappled with questions about maintaining faith in a pagan society and resolving conflicts between loyalty to God and the governing authority over him. These challenges are relevant today and prompt us to consider the impact Western values and American ideals have on the way we honor God and our own governing authority. Despite residing in a foreign land under a pagan government, Daniel's faith in God did not waver, nor did he disrespect the Babylonian officials. His example offers valuable insights for us as we make proper distinctions in honoring God and the governing authorities. For Daniel, his experience under the Babylonian authority was mixed. He and his colleagues received respect and kindness, enjoying the luxuries of palace life and eating the finest food and wine. But there was a cost. Daniel had to surrender his Israelite identity and serve a foreign government. As a young man between 15 and 20, Daniel faced immense pressure as a royal captive. He was entirely 
dependent on King Nebuchadnezzar, a king who lavished him with wealth and luxury. His situation can be likened to a high school graduate attending an out-of-state university. While parents hope their child resists ungodly cultural influences, the temptation to conform to popular opinions for social acceptance and career advancement can be strong. However, Daniel was no conformist. He refused to compromise his faith with popular cultural influences. He abstained from the royal food and wine to maintain his purity. His refusal stemmed from his deep commitment to God's dietary laws. But this commitment also challenged his relationship with the governing authority. Not eating the king's food would be viewed as an insult. So Daniel approached Ashpenaz, the chief official, and with respect asked permission to avoid the unclean food. Unfortunately, his request was denied, leading to a crucial test of his commitment to God in the face of a government mandate. Undeterred, he proposed a 10-day experiment to a lower-level official, suggesting a diet of simple foods like fruits and vegetables. This adjustment showcased Daniel's wisdom and his moral integrity. He respectfully navigated the process, aligning his request with God's law while honoring the government authority. In our current culture, shifts in public morals, both on the liberal left and conservative right, have presented challenges like redefining marriage to include same-sex unions, state laws supporting abortions, and public schools promoting beliefs contrary to our own. When faced with these issues, it's tempting to lose respect for the government. For some, their Christian identity serves as a pretext to disrespect or disobey government orders, even when the scriptures make no clear judgment. In a society where criticizing government officials has become commonplace, Christians must stand up for legitimate governing authority. And the legitimate governing authority is the one to whom God has given the power of the sword, whether it be an autocratic or democratic state. Individuals in positions of authority deserve respect, honor, and obedience. Having spent years in China, I observed the challenges Chinese Christians faced under an atheistic totalitarian regime. Their responses varied. A sizable number focused on criticizing the government and seeking change. But those who impressed me were those who focused not on politics, but on letting their light shine. In America, by contrast, a land blessed with an incomparable level of religious freedom. Do we ever lose focus? Complaints about the government's unchristian ethics are common, and though threats to religious freedom do lurk, does an exaggeration of these threats lead us to speak falsely and dishonor God's servant? This isn't meant to shame or elevate any Christian group, but to highlight a widespread Christian shortcoming. Compared to Daniel, we often struggle to show respect and honor toward governing authorities. Sometimes resorting to defiance or complaints about an imperfect system, completely overlooking the blessings these authorities provide. While God offers real benefits through the government, such as peace and order, he also aids those who strive to honor those in authority. Daniel's experience in Babylon serves as an illustration of this. Even though his initial request to abstain from the king's food was denied, God influenced Ashpenaz to look favorably at Daniel and at least listen to his plea. Verses 11 and 14 of our text reveal God's favor extending to Daniel again as he widely, wisely adjusted his request. And again, we see God's favor when the lower-level official consented to Daniel's request for a 10-day trial period. A diet of fruit 
and vegetables, which God blessed, to improve the health of Daniel and his compatriots. An improvement the lower level official recognized and by God's favor permitted Daniel and his friends to continue. Atop all of this, God blessed Daniel and his companions with knowledge and understanding of Babylonian literature and learning, a blessing that encompassed not just factual knowledge, but also prudence and cultural tact, something vital for maintaining positive relationships in a foreign culture. Moreover, Daniel was given the unique ability to interpret dreams, which set him apart among Babylon's court officials and earned him the king's respect. These experiences exemplify how God's hand guided Daniel, enabling him to navigate the challenges of honoring both God and the governing authorities. It's crucial to note that Daniel didn't act out of mere duty, but was empowered by God's grace, which Daniel recognized well, a recognition we find throughout the reading whenever Daniel speaks of God's blessing. This is a blessing with which we too are familiar, a blessing that finds the ultimate embodiment in God's promise of a Savior. Like Daniel, this servant faithfully honored God and the governing authorities, albeit with two differences. Jesus did so perfectly, and his reason for doing so was distinct, to provide hope and redemption for those who acknowledge their inability to honor God and the governing authorities. In our gospel lesson today, Jesus was confronted by the Pharisees and Herodians. The Pharisees despised Roman authority, while the Herodians cherished privilege, privileges they obtained through their loyalty to Rome, a loyalty which they prized more than their loyalty to God. Despite these two groups contrasting views, they united against Jesus in their interest to trap the Son of God. They asked Jesus whether it was right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar. Jesus responded that they should pay it, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. Jesus emphasized that we owe honor and respect to God and the earthly authorities. So what do we do when the government overreaches? Indeed, it should not lead us to political apathy or disrespect, but rather a willingness to bear the contentious situation as our cross. Just look at Christ, confronted by a mob. Peter struck, but Jesus ordered his sword be put away. Before the high priest, Jesus was struck for speaking truthfully. Confronted by the Roman procurator, Jesus endured physical blows, false accusations, and the public spectacle of his misery. Through all this, Jesus didn't call up the legion of angels who awaited his orders. Instead, he willingly endured these injustices so that his sacrifice could justify you. Carrying the cross is challenging since we easily slip underneath the weight. However, Christ carried our cross perfectly without vanity or pride. He didn't seek to establish an earthly paradise or claim his rightful authority. Instead, he displayed humility and selflessness, placing our interests before his own. He recognized our failure to honor God in the governing authority. And so he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. He endured the greatest injustices of earthly authority, not to save us from a similar fate, but to absolve us of our guilt when we do not act humbly in lesser situations. Jesus offered his best in exchange for our worst, and his blood atoned for our failure to honor God and the governing authority. As we reflect on our collective response to recent challenges, such as the COVID-19 mandates or our contentious elections. We acknowledge our shortcomings as Christians. However, these trials have prepared us for what lies ahead. Let's pray to God that 
His wisdom and understanding help us learn from our past mistakes. As the Lord blessed Daniel, so will he bless us so that our thoughts, words, and actions align perfectly with our Christian identity. Despite living as an exile, Daniel's unwavering faith encourages us to tread a scriptural path that honors God and the governing authority. His story remains relevant today as we grapple with our Christian identity and the temptation to conform to godless norms or dishonor God-given authority. While we recognize our inability to properly honor both, as Daniel found favor with God, we have found favor in God's Son. Jesus perfectly honored God and the governing authorities and took our disobedience in exchange for his perfect obedience on the cross. Find power in your state of forgiveness as you continue to honor both. Amen. We will now join together in reading the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead, and he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us now join together in the prayer of the Church. Almighty God, we acknowledge with thanks that all we have and enjoy is a gift from your gracious hand. We come now before you today in heartfelt appreciation for our nation and its people. We thank you for enabling us to worship you in freedom and to serve you without fear. You have enriched us with the bounties of farm and factory, the beauty of forest and mountain, and the marvels of medicine and science. For all these blessings, we praise and glorify you. Look with favor upon our nation and preserve our cherished liberties. Enable our leaders to govern with wisdom, honesty, courage, and justice. Protect those who serve in the armed forces and those who maintain peace and safety in our communities. Give us willingness to obey our nation's laws and to work for the common good. Keep our financial institutions secure and our economy strong. Bless our fields that they may produce abundant harvests. Guard us from calamities of nature and accident. And spare our land from the ravages of disease and epidemic. Teach us not to worry, but to cast all our cares on you. Strengthen the homes of our nation. By your spirit, lead husbands and wives to love each other, parents to nurture their children, young adults to assume responsibility, and children to show respect. To you, O Lord, we bring our thanks and our requests. Hear our prayers for Jesus' sake. Amen. And hear us, O Lord, as we join to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We bring our worship service to a close by singing select verses of Before You, Lord, We Bow.
We're so glad you were able to join us today, and we pray that you are edified, enlightened, and encouraged through the worship that we had together. May the Lord richly bless you in the week ahead, and we look forward to seeing you again.